Well, let me welcome you to the second panel. My name is Peter Coharis. I'm a visiting fellow at the American Security Project and an attorney here in Washington. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce myself briefly, uh, talk a little bit about the focus of this panel, ask our panelists to introduce themselves and talk a very little bit about what they're doing, and then open it up to the floor because I think these conversations are always the most helpful and the most informative when we respond to audience participation and questions. There's a lot of expertise I know in the audience, and I think it would be uh, fun and most edifying for all of us if we just have a dialogue uh, going. So that's our goal. Um, the uh, impulse of this panel was in a city, and this is not to denigrate anyone's work, uh, but in a city where uh, many people commit themselves to thinking about, writing about, and constructing policies for what other people should be doing. Uh, it might be interesting to, f to have a panel composed of people who are doing the doing, uh, specifically investing, uh, raising capital, uh, and deploying that capital in Africa, and to hear what sort of challenges, what sort of opportunities, and also what significance, if any, U.S. policy and other policies have with respect to their operations and uh, their activities. Um, let me just briefly introduce myself. I'm a visiting fellow here at the American Security Project. I've lived and worked uh, in Africa and traveled in a number of places in Africa. I represent uh, both foreign governments uh, in Africa, in East and West Africa, and I also represent foreign investors uh, in Africa and other emerging markets. Uh, I've had a uh, small boutique firm, and we assist with the entire foreign investment cycle from having some role with respect to raising capital uh, and finding sources of investments to uh, transactional, uh, to uh, legal compliance, uh, corporate social responsibility, anti-money laundering, anti-bribery compliance, uh, to uh, assisting with informal dispute resolution, and ultimately, if necessary, uh, formal dispute resolution including arbitration. Uh, I've also write quite a bit on U.S. foreign policy and have been published in a number of uh, publications in the United States and overseas. Um, with that, I'd like to, uh, oh, some of the topics uh, that our panel will be discussing today are to what extent are U.S. government policies and agencies relevant to what they do, both with respect to the day-to-day, -day, but also the larger picture. Um, uh, we've already heard a little bit about the U.S. model versus the Chinese model. The Chinese model is now, as you've all heard, evolving from the classic resources for infrastructure to doing more private investment. Uh, what suggestions might some of our panelists have for U.S. policymakers, both with in the administration and also on the Hill? Uh, uh, if we want, we can talk about it. I don't think any of our panelists do project finance and engage too much directly with OPIC and Exim Bank. But we might want to talk a little bit about that and their approach and the debt-oriented approach and whether that's sufficient and necessary uh, in today's investment climate. Uh, what kind of um, challenges do they have with respect to raising capital uh, with their investors, with uh, the demand for uh, return on investment? Uh, what sort of changes have they experienced in the last five years? Uh, practical things like uh, risk profile, portfolio profile, uh, exit strategies with respect to investing in Africa, which a lot of people forget about. It's not just enough to invest. Eventually, you have to uh, you have to be able to uh, recover your investment. Uh, Non-market challenges, both with respect to governments, not only at, at the uh, central government level, but also the regional and local levels, which, again, a number of people forget about. Um, we talked a little bit before in the last panel about uh, non-state risk like uh, Ebola, security issues, terrorism, but what, what sort of other civil strife or unrest, um, uh, anti-bribery, anti-money laundering, other concerns uh, that, that you face. Uh, uh, and also, if, if you want to be so bold and are interested, what are the strategic implications for what it is you do with respect to the United States, with respect to Africa, with respect to uh, knowledge transfer, development, uh, what do you see as, as your role, in, after all, this is American Security Project, um, what is your role, if any, and I know that's not a main focus, but if you'd like to talk a little bit about what your experience has been in, with, with respect to that, I think uh, that those comments also be very welcome. And then finally, uh, entrepreneurialism. Uh, the next stage, many people are saying, and I'm aware of a couple of funds who've, who've started to really focus on entrepreneurs at a very basic level, not quite venture capital in the Silicon Valley sense, but, but 
getting beyond the sort of up and existing uh, companies with strong balance sheets and, and uh, revenues and to be a little bit more uh, 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 granular with respect to development and, and investment. So those are a lot of topics. We certainly won't be able to get to all of them or do any of them justice, but I wanted to throw those out and invite uh, Patrice to start with the self-introductions. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. My name is Patrice Becker. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Epic Funds. Um, Epic Funds is a private equity um, shop based in Dakar, Senegal, and we currently manage $122 million raised uh, primarily from development finance institutions in uh, Europe and Africa, uh, no U.S. investors at the institutional level, as well as um, a reinsurance company based in Nigeria. We focus on uh, 29 countries through uh, West, um, Central, and East Africa, basically from Cape Verde to Rwanda, uh, basically West to East, and Morocco to Angola and North to South. Uh, we currently have um, eight portfolio companies um, in seven sectors. We're in banking, agrochemicals, mining services, oil and gas uh, downstream, automotive assembly, uh, pharmaceuticals, and uh, fast-moving consumer goods. And we operate across 11 countries. Um, and I'll, I'll be able to talk about some of these countries, mostly in West Africa, but we're also in Rwanda, Chad, Liberia, you know, places that I uh, usually don't hear too much about, except you know, with the Ebola crisis. Why do we set up Africa Funds? Really, um, we, you know, um, my partner and I um, were looking at the fact that uh, there were large funds that were you know, focusing on, on fairly large companies, uh, but we wanted to go a little bit more granular and look at African entrepreneurs who have the, re the, the, the potential to become regional blue chips and needed uh, this uh, capital and also the value-added services that we can bring in order to, to be able to reach their potential. And to develop our, our, our vision, we needed to also put together a team of African professionals with a wide range of skills and experiences, which is a little bit different from the, the private equity model you see in developed uh, countries where you basically have you know, PE experts that rely on a number of um, third-party service providers for a number of services. In our case, we have a lawyer in-house we have uh, a, a public accountant, someone with uh, basically public accounting experience in addition to uh, investment bankers and also people with operational experience uh, such as myself in order to be able to speak the language of the entrepreneurs that sit, sit across the table from us. Our strategy is to provide um, growth capital and services to these entrepreneurs and we take minority stakes. By taking minority stakes, that means that we're really investing in people because we're buying into the vision and expertise of uh, the local entrepreneurs that we target. And you know, in our, in our case, we would rather invest in a C-level company with top-level management than the other, other way around because it's really about the people. Um, we really target an unders underserved n a niche, um, one that um, is characterized by the fact that it falls outside of the scope of a lot of funds just because of size. Um, and we are hoping to take these companies, as they say, to the proverbial next level. And what do these companies look like? Um, they have an operational track record. Usually it's, a, it's an entrepreneur or a group of entrepreneurs who've been around for five, you know, sometimes ten years. Um, and they have put together you know, a, a company and developed it to the best of their abilities, but with a number of significant weaknesses. Usually we see them around um, you know, poor or or very little uh, human resource management, um, very um, you know, basic planning uh, capacity, but no strategic planning to speak of. They're too busy reacting to you know, what's in front of them every day. Um, and they also have you know, issues with the capital structure. Usually they're over leveraged, they, they borrow too much, and now need equity to kind of bring the capital structure back to an optimal phase. And, um, in, 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 that, in, in that respect, we happen to, to bring equity, which is uh, a scarce resource still uh, across the, um, the, the, the continent and you know, due to, I, I guess, the embryonic state of uh, capital markets in a number of countries and also the fact that, um, you know, especially on the, on the banking side, um, bankers uh, typically tend not to 
to, to be too um, helpful to these companies in terms of explaining to them what they need to do to raise the, the equity capital to balance the debt. I think I would like to stop you know, there in terms of, of the presentation, uh, but I, you know, we also have views on, on sectors such as financial services, agribusiness, um, fast moving consumer goods manufacturing, which we think are, you know, are just as interesting as you know, the traditional view of Africa, which is you know, that it's all about natural resources and what. Uh, hi guys, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm Jake Cusack, I'm a managing partner at Cross Boundary. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my personal background just because I think it's relevant to the, the topic today. Um, I originally was a, a Marine officer, um, I was in the infantry and worked in intelligence and special operations. Left the Marines actually because I was quite interested in how economic development, and particularly uh, the American private sector, could also be an instrument of foreign policy. And I saw it as a missing element of our foreign policy and my experiences in the Middle East and Asia. Um, so I started working on economic development, got dissatisfied with sort of traditional economic development, was very interested in the access to capital side and the investment side. Went back to business school, worked um, for Raj Capital, which is a large emerging market private equity firm. Um, and then with a couple of our partners started Cross Boundary, which is specifically targeted at engaging um, the American private sector and, and Western investors and, and businesses generally um, in fragile states and, and conflict-affected countries. Um, from our perspective, we believe that, in, and I think this is particularly relevant in Africa, that the foreign policy challenges of today are primarily around weak states rather than strong states. In other words, we're not worried about um, being invaded by Kenya, but we are worried about what would happen um, if Kenya were to destabilize and, and similar things in Egypt. And when you look at these countries, they don't necessarily crave U.S. military bases or membership in our security alliances. But what they do crave is jobs um, for um, a young, unemployed uh, class of people. They crave businesses, real businesses, that can replace um, the natural resources which are dwindling, which they've traditionally relied upon for growth. Um, they crave a narrative of hope, which can provide stability um, within um, the, the politics of that country. And they need tax money, they need tax revenues. Um, and a virtuous cycle between businesses that are paying those taxes and the government um, that actually provides the necessary services. And in that context, I think the American private sector of um, you know, the various things that America has to offer has a very strong reputation still in these countries where um, some of our you know, military activities or diplomatic activities may not always have that. Um, and there's great admiration in, in most of these countries for um, what they see as, as the entrepreneurship, um, the technical goal, um, innovation, um, with educational institutions that exist in the U.S. and a desire to engage with Western capital. So we think it can be a very valuable instrument of foreign policy. Um, how does translate for us is advising on transactions, investment transactions in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in South Sudan, um, potential transactions in uh, Liberia and Mali, uh, Haiti, and, and similar places. And then we've uh, worked in some slightly more tame markets as well, such as Kenya um, and Ethiopia. Um, not not in um, oil and gas usually, or, or natural resources, because um, there's usually pretty good advisory services already available there, and they don't necessarily need our help, but generally in, in more consumer-facing sectors. I think for investors entering these markets and companies entering these markets, the reason that they enter, um, one is there's a great perception arbitrage opportunity between the reality on the ground in these countries and what for most investors, um, if they're based in the US or the UK or elsewhere, perceive um, as the opportunities. So if you think about people um, you know, huddled over their desks in New York right now looking for tiny differences between the perceived value of a stock and the actual underlying fundamentals, those differences are massive as soon as you go to one of these countries, and, and also in terms of within geographic areas within the countries. Um, there's an advantage to being the first mover. There's a pioneer payoff to being in these countries, um, you know, particularly on the long term growth trajectory, these countries, frontier markets generally, are growing at three times the rate of developed markets. Um, so, you know, GDP doesn't, growth doesn't necessarily correlate um, to returns in individual investment, but it's certainly a healthy um, tailwind to have behind you. Um, and I think importantly in the context of, of sort of policy and some and Power Africa and OPIC and, and these other initiatives, the existence of concessionary finance or, or grant tools that can be leveraged um, subsidies that do make it more attractive to, to work in, in some of these places. So being able to access low-cost debt financing through OPIC um, 
or another development finance institution where you might not otherwise be able to get financing in a place like South Sudan or Afghanistan certainly makes investments possible that would not be possible uh, with, without um, OPIC. And when the U.S. government or the IFC or other things decide to focus on a particular sector um, or a particular region, um, some of those tools can change the calculus and, and make investments in those places more attractive than they would otherwise be. Um, that's sort of a broad area. I'll, I'll leave it there and then we can delve into specific things. Um, just to, not to embarrass anyone, our entire panel of stars, but Jake actually earned a bronze star. Thank you for your service. <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that. Carolyn? Yes, um, Carolyn Campbell, by way of my own background, it wasn't in Africa. In the 90s, I was in Eastern Europe, based in Poland, and was uh, working on privatization and capital markets and part of a very rapid transformation and growth. And uh, I had experienced the emerging markets that I then got invited to join a group that was forming an Africa fund, and I initially said no. I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. It was 2000. Africa was on the cover of The Economist as the lost continent. It didn't sound terribly exciting, uh, but the group was exciting. It was a group of Wall Street um, veterans, and so I went and did it, and the same thing is happening again. So that's the long short of, of my personal trajectory. So the group I joined was Emerging Capital Partners in 2000, and we have raised um, over $2 billion now for Africa. We've made over 60 investments. We fully exited 33 of them. So we've exited them on stock exchanges. We've exited them on sales to other financial investors or strategic investors. We've sometimes had entrepreneurs want to buy their state or our state back because the company is so doing so well. Um, I mean, it has all been roads. There have been a couple of, of, of companies that haven't performed, but that's to be expected. For the large part, we have absolutely had uh, been uh, had the tailwind of growth at our backs. Um, we uh, our main goal has been to build sustainable businesses in Africa. We started off with our first fund in infrastructure, so we did uh, which included telecommunications, and it was all about penetration. Africa had two percent penetration in telecom, and it grew to sixty percent in those five years or six years of our first fund. Um, same thing is happening in insurance and banking. So in 2005, we added financial services. You look at low penetration rates, and you see that the demand outstrips supply, um, and it's a great place to invest. Um, we finally, our last fund, we added on more of a consumer focus and invested in uh, consumer-facing businesses like a Starbucks type of fast, uh, repeatable box experience in Kenya and Tanzania. Um, and we're looking at more of those and most recently have invested in three universities in Africa. So we're creating a university platform company and um, very wide sectoral focus. Uh, but I would say going forward it will be something of a consumer business and critical business needs, which doesn't leave much out except real estate. Um, but that will be our focus. So you, you also have a theme that would be relevant to American security, which, be, which would be that um, we invest in the private sector. So it's private equity, you're investing in private companies in the private sector, and trying to stay a bit away from governments um, and privatizations and this sort of a thing. Because it is an emerging market, it does have instability, but if you're in the private sector and you're, you're functioning in a private company, you can withstand those types of stresses. We have a salt mine in Djibouti. We went through the whole um, Navy SEAL takedown of a boat. We were being, our, our, our ships were looking at being pirated coming out of Djibouti full of salt. Uh, we were in the Westgate Mall where one of our Starbucks type businesses was up and running in a Planet Yogurt that we're invested in and that got um, blown up uh, four months later by Al-Shabaab. Um, we've lived through the Jasmine Revolution in Tunisia and just in January of this year, listed a consumer products company that makes diapers and adult hygiene products and tissue boxes. And it's up 50% trading this year um, because one of the outgrowths of the revolution is people could not export their dollars out of Tunisia. So you list a decent company on the exchange and everybody buys. Um, I, Ivory Coast, we've been an investor in Ivory Coast since 2003. So the initial coup d'etat, we had just bought Air Ivoire, and we lived through the recent civil um, 
Civil War, we were operating the country's utilities, electricity and water, and it really hasn't affected operations that much because we, we tend to be in the private sector or have some other protections in place. Um, that said, the theme I would touch on of why do you need American security, it helped us in Djibouti, and, and of course it's helping us in Kenya for sure with, with Al-Shabaab, with a lot of business in Kenya and, and in East Africa. Um, and we've talked to a lot of um, folks like Jake here before we go investing in southern Ethiopia with the ONLF. But it is that if the U.S. and U.S. investors are not going into Africa, you have a lot of other investors that are going in with, with very high geostrategic interests, such as the Chinese. We don't tend to bump into the Chinese in Africa. They don't operate the way we do. I'm sure they don't operate the way Patrice does. Um, they buy up entire natural resources companies because they have the potential to do that. We have had some exposure to natural resources and buying 5% stakes and 10% stakes, and then MidMetal comes along and buys the whole company from us. So it's, it's really a very different dynamic in terms of the way that um, different regions of the world are able to compete in the business sector for very definite geostrategic reasons. The, um, we have OPIC as a big investor. They provide debt that supports our funds, and I believe, you know, they are the only sort of sovereign investor that isn't allowed to take an equity stake so in, in the world. So you have, you know, the Koreans are able to buy shares of their sovereign wealth fund, the, the Singaporeans, and you have uh, the French buying stuff all over the place, the European investment bank. Um, so that's another theme that I think is very interesting and might be interesting to the, the crowd. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Just, just uh, thank you, Carolyn, and, and just remind people that Fadi is one of our, our hosts and sponsors, so thank you again. Thank you, and Carol is one of our co-investors in a company in the company. Yeah. Uh, my name is Fadi Al Salamin. I'm a principal of YCF Group. We manage and operate a few companies in the telecom, agriculture, and uh, shipping industries. Uh, I, I don't want to repeat what some of my colleagues here said, so if you allow me, I'll just tell you an example about uh, one country we work in. And then hopefully you'll you'll take away from it what um, what uh, they've discussed, and also you see that there is a huge potential um, on the continent. We we work in as I said we work in uh, in telecom. So one of the last uh, prizes of telecom that exists in the world is Ethiopia. Uh, 90 million people, uh, state-owned mobile operator, and every telephone company in the world is looking and waiting. For that market to to open. So several years ago, we received an invitation from the late Prime Minister uh, Malazenawi, and he said uh, we asked would they be interested in um, opening the telecom sector. And so the invitation came and said yes, we'd like to discuss it with you. Please come to Ethiopia. So we went to Ethiopia. We had the discussion and. <laughs> our surprise, he said, telecom is not open for discussion, but the country is open for investment. So we st <laughs> said, okay, great. We said, uh, what other ideas do you have for us? He said, you do shipping. We have uh, a bright population. We graduate every year, 5,000 electrical and mechanical engineers. Look there, there might be something for you. So it turns out there's a huge shortage for uh, cadets on ships, much like there's a shortage for nurses, much, you know. So, uh, and we have 4,000 ships that, and, and clients that own ships that we manage and, and, and under the Liberian flag. So one of the things that we, we decided to set up in Ethiopia, which have been a huge success, is uh, the largest maritime training institute. Um, our clients from, German ships to uh, Greek sh ship owners to you name it, extremely happy with uh, the work ethics, with the uh, expertise and talents of Ethiopian uh, mechanical and electrical uh, engineers. Um, in Ethiopia, an electrical engineer might make about $5,000, uh, maybe $6,000 a year. On our ships, they the lease salary is about thirty to thirty-five thousand uh, dollars a year. So you can imagine the impact you make on 
one person's life. You can imagine the um, the resources that you are bringing into the country and the ability to scale this up as you move from, we're now at about close to, let's say, a thousand people a year. You move that to 2,000 and 3,000 uh, people a year and you can already start having ideas. I know Dante is already thinking, how can I sell them insurance? <laughs> so, <laughs> there is a huge potential. So, I, I just, I, I don't want to go any longer. This is just one small example. You've heard already the, 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 the deep details of, you know, the return on investment and the accessibility to resources. One other thing I, I will mention about Ethiopia, um, the government does, uh, or the banks, the state-owned banks, do uh, lend to local investors or foreign investors. Um, I believe one of, one of the examples that we are having right now, we're working on an agricultural project. The, the local banks are actually willing to give you up to 70% uh, loan of the project. So that's just um, Ethiopia as an example, and I, I'd rather talk about something that I know and I've dealt with, and so hopefully this is uh, helpful to you. So. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, Ethiopia Telecom is actually one of my clients. Uh, oh. <laughs> so, um, I know it's traditionally the chair starts things off with questions, but I really do want to try to open things up quickly. Uh, I see some hands. Uh, can we just start uh, right off and be happy to supplement. Uh, if you could identify yourselves and uh, we can start the uh, discussion going, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Happy to bring me. I'm interested. Please in wait for the microphone. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. My name is Ibrahim Ramey. Um, I'm interested in two things. Number one, um, how can I'm also a private investor. I'm interested in, number one, how can people find uh, projects below the state investment level, particularly ones that are uh, women-owned and women-managed local enterprises that can be invested in, primarily social investments as well as capital investments. Secondly, uh, regarding sustainable energy, um, solar and geothermal, are there investment opportunities in that sector uh, and how might they be located? Thank you. And uh, we'll be hearing from an OPIC representative in the next panel. But as you know, social impact investing is a huge um, priority of OPICs. Uh, who wants to tackle the social impact investing and anyone want to do sustainable energy? Yes, it would be a good place to start is to throw that back. What would be your target in terms of the social impact you're trying to have? Because everything we do on, on the panel here probably has a social impact. Our investor base, I know that Patrice has our African Development Bank, we have a bunch of DFIs. We, have, we, we make a social impact. The, one of our oil companies right now, in, and it's a huge company, has started an Ebola education, a girls' school, uh, hospitals, and it's a huge focus for investing. Um, but it really is sort of a sector by sector thing. There are ethical mining funds, there are invest in education, you can uh, microfinance at the very smallest area, um, and then there's technological advances that help society as well. So mobile healthcare uh, apps that you can, you can um, use that give access to healthcare to people, or pharma, getting basic pharma into the middle of Morocco. Um, has a huge social impact. So you almost have to first narrow down what your focus is, and I think uh, the investment would, would be there. Um. Yeah, just to, just to add to what Carol said, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the private sector in Africa has been much maligned, um, and at the same time is the core of, of development. I mean, if we don't have a strong private sector, where are we going? And so, Anything that can be done to strengthen the African private sector, I think, has just by its own, by, by, by definition, uh, a social impact. What we want to be able to do is to make sure that the companies we invest in come out much stronger after our investment, much better structured institutionally, so that they can be sustainable and increase the number of jobs they provide. The multiplier effect is there for every job that you have. There are probably five or six people who depend on that job. and so. We, you know, we view 
even though we are in the business of making money, we view the work we do as essential to maintain and develop the, the social structure of the countries in which we invest. I mean, that's, that's the basics. Beyond that, then we now have some social impact funds, for example, that, that um, specialize a little bit. You, know, you mentioned, for example, women and women-owned enterprises. Uh, you're, you're talking about um, you know, rural development in certain countries. And now, some, some firms want to have aspect, uh, sorry, exposure to that aspect of, of social, um, you know, social development. But in general, just the, the, the nature of, of building the private sector in Africa, I think, is by itself um, you know, social investment. Yeah, I think the, the term sort of impact has lately become sort of misappropriated. Um, I would argue that there are, um, impact now seems to mean very small transactions um, focused around um, very specific uh, sectors or technology innovations and then sort of average maybe investment size of 100,000 to a million. Um, most of these investments um, fail. Um, for a couple reasons. One is just the transaction costs associated with making these sorts of investments overwhelm the potential economics of the investment, so it makes it difficult for those funds to succeed. A second is that something that sounds very good in a, a TED talk or is a very good you know, article um, in Forbes magazine does not necessarily translate into real returns um, in Africa when, 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 when that idea is brought there. Um, so I would argue that that's, you know, there's a number of firms out there that have gotten a lot of publicity you know, for the impact that they're having in Africa. But if you look at what's actually driving job creation, um, education, and even CSR benefits, it's coming much more from the larger uh, investments um, uh, that both of you are making than from some of these smaller funds. Um, you know, that said, I think there are, and if you're interested to talk about it, there's a number of good organizations that specialize in, in the impact space. Um, and if you have, you know, particular causes that you're passionate about, I think you know, there can be a very good match. Um, for that, um, but it's not what's going to eventually attract the huge amount of institutional private capital that is required to drive, um, you know, growth across the continent of Africa. Um, on, on the solar note, I should have mentioned we're actually spinning out um, of Cross Boundary as our first foray into direct investment, um, Cross Boundary Energy, which is doing distributed solar in East Africa. Um, we do see a great opportunity in, in solar specifically because we were working with a lot of small and medium enterprises in Africa um, that were running purely on diesel, that were off the grid. So their cost of power was you know, 30 cents a kilowatt hour or higher. At those rates, um, solar does make sense, or, or hybrid solar diesel to match um, some part of the power requirement. And what we're doing is providing the financing so that those um, businesses can buy power on a 10-year power purchase agreement as opposed to outlay the capital up front um, Required for, for solar. Solar is very capex intensive at the beginning, um, but has a reasonably good payback period, whereas diesel is, is cheap to get the generator, but very expensive in the fuel. Look, let me just uh, make one quick observation. That private equity is probably not the best vehicle for small scale social impact. You're really thinking more in terms of microfinance, and, and those institutions, I think, tend to really be more adept and focused than I think most private equity funds, precisely for the reasons that Jake mentioned, that the economics of doing the deal versus the return, the one-offs are just not worth it. Um, but anyway, let's uh, continue. Uh, sir, sir, and I'll get behind you. Hi. Um, well, Africa, roughly 1.5 billion people, I guess. Uh, different forms of government. Um, could you introduce yourself? I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I'm Raj. I'm just a DC resident. I'm not associated with any organization. Um, so, given the number of people, uh, number of traditions, cultures, languages, forms of governance, uh, how do you address the issue of corruption? Um, well, big companies, I understand, have resources, uh, you know, some money, and uh, human capital uh, to address the issues that. Somebody was talking about uh, women owned businesses, small businesses. How can they address this issue? Sure, but I think the answer is in, in your question already. Uh, it's like you said, it's different governments, different, uh, you know, the different styles of governance. So, 
uh, and I'll give an example of, uh, of countries that we work in, Ethiopia, for example. Um, we've been there for about eight years. We have yet to face uh, any form of shakedown or corruption. The government itself has a very strong anti-corruption institution. Um, if every once in a while you hear about arrests that have been made, almost to the point where government officials are paranoid even to to open subjects like this. So it depends. But then obviously there are other countries where the opposite is the norm. So it it really it depends on the country. The the question that I think we as investors also struggle with um, is who do you turn to? Let's say you're already in the middle of the investment, you already have a business existing in some of these countries, uh, you're an American company and you are facing uh, a corruption issue. Sometimes corruption doesn't come straight in the face, meaning pay me, it comes in the form of, uh, oh, you have a fee you have to pay. The, the government, you know, a new fee or a new regulation that says you must you forgot to pay it's this and this. Um, then who you go to? You know, it's an obviously it's a it's, it's a different form of shakedown. But you come to the U.S. government, can they support you? I, that's really I think the, the question, and I don't know the answer. I don't think yeah, I think in, in our case, um, you know, this is some, something that we do worry about on a, on a daily basis. Um, the there are two levels in a way to your question. At the institutional level, large companies. We basically take a, a zero tolerance approach. When we do our due diligence, and one one of the reasons why you know, we have um, you know one of our directors you know has a, a public auditing background is to basically go through you know all of the financials, dig behind financials, and find out what is going on with X Y Z type of transaction. Could this be this guy's corruption? And and then once once we encounter that type of, of activity, we basically tell the company, look, you have to fix this. You know this is going to be condition proceeding to our investments, there's no way we can invest in a company and this type of activity continues. Then the company has a choice to make, fixes it, and, and, and makes sure it's on the straight and narrow, or basically we part ways. Um, the second, uh, you know, but at the individual level, let's say you're a small merchant woman in a market, and you know you have you know, some, some, some official who's basically asking every day for a five naira bribe. I think you know that's a different. That's much more difficult. This is something that has to be taken care of at the level of it's a, it's a governance issue, and in you know in the case of a country like Nigeria, it's not even at the federal level. It's not even at the state level. This may be at the city level, right? With you know municipal officers and so forth. I think what a lot of um, you know those poor merchant women do, they basically pass it off as a you know this is a, a cost of doing business, and they they're, they're not going to challenge it not until. Basically, authorities come to the top and say, you know what, we don't want this anymore. Some countries, like Fadi will say, are, you know, do much better than others. We have experience in Rwanda. We're, we're an investor in Rwanda, and I can tell you, I can sleep, you know, without any problem because I know in Rwanda I'm not going to get that type of issue at any level. Um, in the case of other countries, that, that it's not the same. So again, you know, the the poor, you know, basically. Your individual person will pass it off as a cost of doing business. We have the luxury of basically putting our foot down and saying, "This we're not going to tolerate it. You have a choice to make." Well, can you talk about compliance? And sure. I mean, I, two, two developments since 2008, which was the pinnacle of corruption scandals globally, which ironically was was not in, in emerging markets; it was here. But um, one is your CFO is very key probably no matter what size company you have, because you can get into a clean company, but the way that you monitor how your money is spent and how these revenues flow is with this one person and, and the, or the controller. The other thing is, you've seen a proliferation of businesses, they're investigative businesses, so they're ex-Greens or ex-Sub, ex-CIA, and they, they're diligence, control risk, hoplets, you've got M6, you've got M5, you've got South Africans, Israelis, you can hire a bunch of different people to come and look behind the scenes. They interview the politicians, they interview the banks, they interview the clients. Um, as Patrice is, what Patrice is saying is really important, but it might not be obvious by looking at the books of the company what really is going on. So it varies by country, it varies by you know family businesses, you have to kind of know who's in the family and are they connected to, to politicians. 
And then, of course, all of us here will be familiar with compliance programs. Uh, we're registered with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, so they come in, six guys in your conference room for a week. They're auditing your books. You better have answers to your policies. You have to have tested your policies on each of your companies over time. Uh, they want to know, have there been any instances of corruption? And I would say for the first eight or nine years, we didn't have any either, which was astonishing after Eastern Europe, where uh, the stock register was a fiction and there was a tax lien that nobody knew about and it was really a wild west feel. African, I don't know, Patrice, you can say if you feel this, but it really isn't like that. You have French and English legal systems for the most part. They were trained in the administration, you know, the French administration or the colonial period and, and, and then they developed their own um, identity in terms of how this society functions, but they have a basic functioning that you can identify. You do need to dig pretty deeply, though. We spent a lot more money in terms of hiring these investigators because you can't get in and not have seen it. And I also think you need compliance programs that reach into the investments themselves so that it's not a one-off in terms of we did our due diligence uh, at the time of our investment, but also part of the knowledge transfer management development is teaching your senior managers how to have these programs in place so that nobody gets caught. And I think you're right, Carolyn, the old, the old adage about in Russia there are three sets of books, the actual set, the set you show your investors, and the set you show the tax authorities. So you're right, looking at the books and getting an accountant is, is necessary but not sufficient. Um, yeah, I, was just, I was just going to ask that, to say that in, in, in our case, one of the deterrents we, we we have had to use in, in a particular instance um, was to basically let the person across the table from us know, which was not a company but uh, a regulator, that um, uh, our investors um, happen to be some of the, the largest investors and donors to, to the country, and that therefore, if there was a problem, um, I think we're basically going to run it up the flagpole and you might have to hear from people above him, and I think that quieted him down very, very quickly. Yes. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Rosemary Segiro. I'm the president of Segiro's International Food and Business. Now, my question is on Cairo and Fad. And Cairo, what are you looking at when it comes to the consumer product? I work with small businesses in Kenya. I come from Kenya in agriculture mostly and uh, other African countries like in coffee, tea, and other products. What consumer products are you looking at when it comes to your stock exchange? I get you my card so that you can talk. And you find, uh, what shipping? We have a problem when it comes to shipping from Africa to America, especially agro products and other products which don't have cold storage. When they come to the US, they are, you know, they get to the port, they are, pre they are prevented because they don't have enough storage, cold storage, and they are who end up getting spoiled. How do you see working with me as a company, not other people, me as a company, from Africa bringing the product to America, safe and safety for Americans and other consumers for the, and looking at affordability of the shipping companies from Africa to America, from America to Africa. How do you work with the companies in that manner? And now that we are shipping humanitarian products to Liberia, what are you going to do for us? For our organization to give things to support humanitarian support to to Liberia and to finance. Uh, looking at uh, microfinance, I think Africa now is getting up and uh, to emerging markets. Uh, I don't think microfinance at this time can give much of growth and development for Africa. Let's just go for business for small and medium businesses. How do we help them make it to the actual growth and development? Let's forget about microfinance because microfinance is a woman to sit down, sell her products. You want to export looking at Akoa, looking at uh, development okay. of Africa. What do we do? Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to start with that? Sure. Um, so the answer starts very broad. We'll look at anything. We have looked at everything and thousands of business plans, literally thousands. Uh, I'm going to pick a few elements of the investment strategy that then filter that, you, you know, you have to hit a few prongs in order to be, to come through the filter and get through our process of screening investments successfully. Um, one would be, we tend to look at domestic facing businesses. We don't want to have to necessarily export what we're producing. We want to take advantage of high growth rates in places like Kenya, uh, Rwanda, Uganda. 
So we do tend to like those businesses. That said, we like we like businesses that then you could see expanding into two or three countries so that you're diversified. And if there's a problem with the elections in Nigeria, you at least have your, your Ghanaian um, your Ghanaian operations to stabilize you during that crisis period. Um, the third thing is we like something that has maybe a barrier to entry. So um, it could be a license. You know, a telecom was, was an easy one because it, it, it required a license. But something else, like uh, it's, it's hard to replicate the business model or you have access to uh, the input, the raw inputs, that's on a very favorable basis. So for fertilizer plant, when we produce fertilizer in, in Nigeria, we had very favorable access to gas. Um, and those are the sorts of elements that, that we look for. So scalable businesses that have some protection to them so that their margins are, are, are interesting and that we can grow uh, to scale to either list or sell. Um, on the finance, I think community banking might be the answer, and I'm going to let Patrice say this, but it's the same as in the U.S. You know, there's a large part of the U.S. that's not really banked for business. Community banking is probably the answer. That's right. Fadi, did you want to hear some shipping? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question, by the way. I, I think also Ambassador uh, Jackson kind of touched on that issue as well. Um, for us, you know, in Liberia and in Guinea, particularly now, since we have uh, the issue of Ebola, uh, you are part of the community. You're not just a business that's just looking for profit. You suffer, you know, your business is affected if the country is affected, um, obviously negatively, and if the country is doing well, your business is doing well. So one of the things that we have been working uh, very hard uh, on with the State Department, with other partners, uh, not just here in the U.S., but uh, globally, is how to organize as a private sector uh, a response that uh, would obviously be helpful. So we're using our telephone companies to make available special uh, lines that would um, that we provide to uh, U.S. Uh, health workers who are going there. Uh, we're giving I forgot a few thousand uh, SIM cards and data plans for so that they can record uh, cases immediately. Uh, the lines are specifically made for this issue so that. Uh, there's a timely response. Uh, there are a few other uh, things that I'm working on, but I, I agree with you. you are, if you are part of a, a community and you're working there, it's not just about the profit, it's about how you are acting as a responsible investor and how you are acting as, uh, uh, you know, as part of that community. With regards to shipping, I, we, have, we have not dealt with that specific issue. I do know in Ethiopia, it's a landlocked country, and the, the way we ship is through Djibouti, and, and they are, that's a very uh, state-of-the-art, uh, you know, very modern uh, facility. There's all kinds of, so we have not faced that issue of, uh, you know, uh, at all. I think you bring up um, uh, some, some interesting points. I, I just want to touch quickly on the consumer side. I think it's important to understand that we tend to focus, and I'm sure Carolyn is probably the same, the, the, the narrative of the, the rising middle class is, is important. Now, there may be you know, differences in definition around the middle class, but we, we are basically looking at companies that produce for the local market. And that, that's, a, you know, I think, a departure from looking at exports. You know, when we tend to look at you know, fast-moving consumer goods, it's for the local market because now people have the discretionary income to buy products. Um, and, 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 so, and we see it you know, in, across you know, different types of sectors um, and also different types of countries. Um, with respect to, you know, to, 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 to financial services, I, I think it's important to know microfinance has its place, but so do other types of financial services. Um, you know, commercial banking for the longest was reserved for the elite. It was not really um, you know, underwriting um, you know, loans that, that banks were doing. They were doing name lending. Oh, you're the son of so-and-so. Here, you, know, you, you get like $10 million. Oh, you know what? Your business plan you know, is, looks good, but we don't know who you are. We're not lending to you. And I think that's the model that has to, to change in commercial lending across the West End Central Africa for sure, and probably other parts that are of the, the continent that I don't know as well. Um, but lowering the transaction cost for formal banking is critical. And that's the reasons why the reason why we invested in three banks in places like Liberia, Chad and Rwanda, to be able to get the banks to develop programs to bring more of the unbanked 
into the banking system. And we're seeing, and, 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 and Carmen made a very good point earlier about telecom and what it used to be, you know, I think 10 years ago. We view insurance in the same way, um, you know, for, for different reasons, but you know, global premiums on insurance, Africa represents 2% of the global premiums of insurance today, roughly. Of those 2%, 80% is in South Africa. So the rest is shared among the other 54 countries. And of those 54 countries that have that tiny 0.4%, there are 10 countries like Egypt, Kenya, that have about 80% of it. So you can imagine what the remaining countries share in terms of global premiums. It's tiny. I mean, you know, it's microscopic. And to us, that represents also an opportunity. Um, so I think the development of better services um, you know, community banking certainly is one. Um, more affordable banking at the, at the formal level. And in certain countries, also developing products that are more attuned to the, the local um, you know, beliefs, like for example, Islamic banking in Chad. We, we invested in Chad and the bank has rolled out a series of Islamic banking services. To us, it's important to bring more people into the formal financial sector. We're about to run out of time, but I did want to, um, let me get to this gentleman, you'll be the last question, but I did want to ask, uh, given what's happened with the financial crisis, some stagnation in, in developing, in developed countries, have you seen the cost of capital uh, and the difficulty to raise money uh, improve in the last five years, become much more difficult without giving away trade secrets? What kind of uh, return on investments are your investors looking for? You all have very different business models and approaches in terms of your investing. I'm just curious if you could give us ranges or give us a little bit of sense of the market realities and then maybe we will finish up with this gentleman. Okay, um, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, well, the, you know, the financial crisis has had two effects. It has made fundraising a little bit more difficult, but at the same time, it had the, the positive effect of deflating asset prices, which allowed us to make investments at lower uh, EBITDA multiples than where they were before. So, you know, there, there's, there's a balance there. If you look globally, I think um, of the private equity transactions, about 50% of them have been in multiple of between 5 and 7.5 times EBITDA globally. 25% have been above 7.5 times. Um, in Africa, the, the so, so basically below 5 times is globally 25%, whereas in Africa, of the declared transactions or disclosed, I think between 40 and 45 percent have been at below five times, which and this is probably our red line in terms of you know what we look at in terms of valuation. Um, that's you know that so so again there 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 have been positive you know, pros and cons to 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 the prices, but we're, we've really moved out of that. And I think you know the, the the interest and the capital is there, and it's it's a matter of LPs or investors finding. The, the, the right funds for what they were trying to do. And on the other side, I think you know, transactions are becoming more competitive again. Yeah, I think in terms of uh, the, the financial crisis and um, in terms of where the Fed has set the rates has allowed the debt markets to an interest in emerging markets and <coughs> frontier markets and, and directed a lot of capital flows. So as those rates come back up, it will be interesting to see how that affects debt. But from the perspective of, of equity, um, you know, I think you know, the, the, I think that what, what private equity firms go out and advertise is sort of their, their target rates of return um, are pretty similar across a number of geographies. Um, and then what's actually delivered um, is a different thing as well. Um, I think most African private equity firms would say they're, in, correct me if I'm wrong, but targeting 25% IRRs. Um, if you look at sort of the IFC's portfolio fund investments, that's actually delivered around 18% IRR. Um, but the other reason that, that you know, I don't that institutional investors go to these markets is that they're less correlated um, with developed markets. So how your investment performs in um, Kenya or certainly in a place like Chad is very little to do um, with how the U.S. market is performing, and that is attractive from a diversification point of view. Um, I think there is a challenge in, in certain markets. You know, just because you're in a very risky market doesn't mean that you get a very high return. And certain types of businesses don't just period um, are sort of capped in the types of returns that they can get but these are businesses that are very necessary um, in these countries. So just because you're in South Sudan doesn't mean that you get to have 40% IRRs, and this is where concessionary finance or other ways and tools of, of enticing investors um, to enter, even if they're only gonna get a 15% IRR or, or something that might not be perfect on a risk-adjusted basis. Um, 
makes it more interesting. I think generally, you know, investors when they look at Africa are very interested in, you know, you have the tailwind of growth behind you, and then you just have things like insurance where you know for sure every year more people will be entering the banking system, more people will be insured, there will be more solar in Africa five years from now than there is today, more people will have phones, more people will have smartphones. So there's these very predictable macro trends, and if you can align yourself or be in a, a, um, an associated industry or service to that, um, you know, those are pretty safe bets at this point. I don't have much to add other than um one development since 2008 is, actually it's probably more recent since 2012, is we used to go out in the market to raise money and everybody says, oh, three times money, 25 to 30% return. Everybody does that, that's what you go out and sell. Um, and before people would go, well, I can get that in China. I'm not taking Africa risk, I can go get that in China. And they're not saying that anymore. It turns out you can't really get that so easily in China. Already getting your money out, the government's messing with a lot of businesses, and that's been sort of a positive. Um, there, so there is more money coming into Africa overall that, um, that makes fundraising easier for people like us, but it also probably drives up valuations a little bit in the medium to long term. What do you think of? No, really, no, I, the only thing I'll add is um, we have not sold any business that we have uh, gotten involved with in Africa, and that's our choice. So we're very happy. Sir, if you could, uh, maybe you could ask your question very briefly because we've got to... I'll ask uh, very quick. Caleb Moore of Bulk in Ghana. Um, the question I ask is for those investing in uh, y'all's viewpoints, investors in Africa. Typically, there's a very strong entrepreneurial culture uh, by choice or by necessity. And typically, people have very good ideas, maybe successful, in, for example, hospitality owning hotels, but they want to diversify and start up a new business new sector, say insurance or something, that because typically they're very successful, but also the elite and understand how to move throughout the government lines. How do you as investors that opportunity to so that way where you have somebody very successful in a se excuse me, a separate industry looking to seek either growth growth capital or startup capital for a targeted sector that you're involved with or interested in? Let me ask one person to respond. Who would like to be that person? Go ahead, Mark. Um look the the entrepreneurs we, we deal with, you know, they, they have like 10 million ideas every day. They've been successful in one area. I mean, I, I, can, I can tell you like so many stories. They've been successful in one area, and now the next day, like, hey, Trace, look, you know, I've made money here, now I want to make money there, and completely uncorrelated uncor um, businesses. And, and the way we approach it is we, we don't dismiss it out of hand. You know, we try to figure out, you know, so what's your plan? Who's going to be around you to, to build this? And then the way we protect ourselves, if we decide we're going to go down that path, is to say, okay, you know what? We understand that you know you want to do this. This is of a startup nature. We're not we're a growth equity business. Not um, we don't fund startups. So you're going to take your existing assets. We're going to put them in a vehicle, and that vehicle we're going to make sure we have a stake in. So let's create a holding company so that we know that if the the venture fails, there's something else to fall back on. But otherwise. You know, we're not going to go in blind just because they've been successful in one area, thinking they're going to be successful in the other area. We did it once, we'll never do it again, and it was with Patrice's partner, Congolese <laughs> Shoemakers, into, we took them into voiceover in a protocol. We'll never do it again, and neither will you, so. <laughs> it has to have the features, I think. Well, b before we adjourn, uh, first let me urge you to stay for our, our third panel. Uh, I promise you it won't be give them 15 minutes, they'll save you 15% of your political risk insurance. It's far more complicated and it's far more lucrative and I urge you to stay because it'll be rewarding. Um, but also let me thank everyone on the panel, uh, Patrice, Jade, Carolyn, and Fadi for uh, just a terrific job. Thank you so much.